Okay, so tell me what we're doing here. So this is module three programming, yep. take one. Okay. Now that chair's a little farther away. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay, and here we go. In this video, we'll go into the details of programming for iOS and Android, and especially focus on things that are different from desktop or web programming. We'll cover the following topics in this lecture. First, we'll look at permissions. Then we'll look at responsiveness and ways to increase responsiveness using local storage. We'll also look at background processes and notifications and end with a discussion of some of the OS-specific differences of what you can create on Android versus iOS. So first, let's talk about permissions. On mobile platforms, you have to explicitly ask for permissions to use certain types of functionality. For example, if you want to access the location or you want to access a person's contacts or calendar information, you need to explicitly tell the operating system that you would like to access that information. And on most platforms, that would then inform the user that you'd like to access that information. And they'll have to accept or decline that information in the mobile interface. The latest versions of Android are working much more like iOS in this respect. On Android Marshmallow or newer, you actually have to ask the user if they want to grant your application location permission or contacts permission. Uh, in fact, there are eight categories of information on Android now that you have to explicitly request permission for. And that includes the calendar, the camera, the microphone, uh, making phone calls, accessing contacts, as accessing the user's location, sensors, or SMS information. And so whenever the application needs one of these, you need to explicitly request it. And the code that you can see on the screen right now shows you how to do this. First, you have to check the permissions. And there's a method called check self permissions that you can call and pass it the name of the permission you'd like to check on. In this case, access find location. And that will tell you if you've already been granted that permission. If you haven't, you have to explicitly call request permissions with the permission that you'd like to request. And that will throw up a dialog for the user so that they can decide if they'd like to grant your application that specific permission. And then you have to handle that gracefully. If they say no, your application still has to respond in some way. If it's a permission that's absolutely critical, you might want to explain why you need it and ask again. Otherwise, you should be able to move on whether they've said yes or whether they've said no. On iOS, things are a little bit different, um, but still fairly similar. On the Location Manager, you can request um, authorization to get access to a user's location. And there are two different ways you can request this authorization. You can request a one-time use, um, basically so whenever the application is up and running, you can access their location. And the other type of location request you can make is in the background. So then the application can get updates on where you are. And this is very useful if, for example, you want to have things proactively happen based on where a user is. The latest Foursquare app Swarm does this really nicely. If it detects that you've been in a venue for a set amount of time, it'll pop up a little notification and ask you if you'd like to check in. So that's an example of using location in the background. And that's a different API request on iOS um, than just getting location when the app is currently active. The next topic that we'd like to cover is on responsiveness. Mobile applications need to be extremely responsive and respond to the user's touch immediately when they request some data. And this can be a challenge, because mobile networks are not always super fast, super responsive, or even always available. So there are many methods you can use to make sure your application is very responsive. First, think about everything you're doing when the application first starts up as startup time can often be very annoying to users. If it takes four or five seconds to get your application going, that can often lead to user frustration, lead to user abandonment. So make sure you're not explicitly requesting network information while the app is starting up. Make sure you're caching information locally so that when the user first opens the app, there's some content there. It's basically in the state that they left it in last time. And they don't need to wait for a network to fetch data, which might take multiple seconds to get that information back. Um, this also applies to transitions in the application. So if you can prefetch information ahead of time, 
If you can get the next screen's worth of data of what the user is likely to see, that makes the whole application much more responsive. If you think about an email client, you probably want to fetch the entire list of messages, but actually the content then of each of the messages as well, because then the user can easily navigate back and forth between the list of messages and the actual message without waiting for, for each message to load, which again could take you know, maybe five or 10 seconds depending on network conditions. If you pre-cache all of that and store it in a local database, it makes your whole application much more responsive. Likewise, travel applications, if, for example, an app like TripIt that stores your whole itinerary for different trips that you're taking, if it can cache all that information, that means you can quickly launch the app, you can quickly see where you need to be and when, where you're staying, where the train station is, all without a network connection. And that can be extremely important if you're traveling internationally and might not have a data connection, or you're just in a place where the data connection is really slow. You can get all that information in milliseconds instead of waiting tens of seconds for the network to load specific information. So there are multiple ways to store data locally. If you just have small settings, um, small bits of user profile information, on Android, there's a class called Shared Preferences, where you can store those strings or those numbers and those settings. And on iOS, it's a class called NS User Defaults. And they would work very similar. You just basically define a key and a value, and you can store whole sets of keys and values for your application to access very, very quickly. Both platforms also have local SQLite databases. So if you need to store lots of information or information that you need to search or sort in different ways, you can use the SQLite database on the device. If you think of you know, email, where you have multiple fields and you might want to search and sort it, or a messaging application, those are great examples of where you would want to use the database to store that information to allow quick and easy searching and sorting for your users. Utilizing these and keeping local copies of the data will dramatically improve the responsiveness of your application. And when you're testing your application, make sure you test it in situations where network conditions are really poor to see how responsive it is, to see how quickly users will get a response when they're clicking in various aspects of the system. Um, you know, for example, try it in an elevator, try it in a subway, try it in a basement of a building or inside a big concrete building. Um, I always like to tell my students at MIT to test in the middle of our, our long corridor here because it's a big concrete building that has notoriously poor network connections. So turn off your Wi-Fi, get in some place where you have a poor condition, and try it out. And make sure that your application is responsive even when you're in the worst of situations. So the next topic we'll talk about is background processes. So mobile phones provide a unique opportunity in running computational processes when the user is not explicitly in your application. This is something that you can't really do on the web um, because you just have a certain web page up and you can only interact with the user when that page is, is available. But on Android explicitly, you can run any kind of computation you want in the background. You can monitor a user's location and proactively show things to them based on where they are. You can remind people of certain things that they need. You can have timers that go off in the background, check information on the network, or just remind people about things that they need to do in their lives. Uh, this, this part I'm going to re-record. Um, we can start at the background processes bit, I think. Um, I was let me just, off. Yeah. yeah. You, sir. Oh, <laughs> I was like, wow. 